I'll start with, uh, again, the same data that I mentioned earlier, but for the U.S. and China. If you measure output in China and the U.S. at what's called international prices, a common set of prices, or what's called purchasing adjusted prices, the Chinese economy is bigger than the U.S. economy. China is currently about 18 percent of world output, and the U.S. is about 15 and a half percent of world output. This is a fundamental change from 40 years ago. In 1980, the U.S. was about 21 percent of world output, and China was about two and a half percent of world output. Between 1980 and 2020, China grew at a rate of nearly 10 percent per year. When you have economic growth at 10 percent per year, it means your economy doubles in size every seven years. So in 35 years, it doubles five times, or two times two times two times two times two, 32 time increase. And that's basically what happened with China. Why, by the way? Because China started incredibly poor, and it caught up to a significant extent. When you're poor, there's lots of headroom, electrification, education, building roads, building rail, and that's what China did extremely effectively for 40 years. Excellent economic management for 40 years. And now, they didn't close the gap in living standards because the living standards by this measure that I keep referring to puts China at about 30 percent of the U.S. level. But since China's four times the population, it makes it a larger economy in total. Well, let me just give you the upshot of this. This is freaking out American policymakers. It's what a psychologist or a psychiatrist <clears throat> would call a neurotic reaction. Because no one gave China the permission to be bigger than the United States. And that wasn't supposed to happen. In 1992, the U.S. achieved unipolar status, the sole superpower. And that was supposed to last for many decades. And lo and behold, 30 years later, it ended. And the American reaction is, we are so smart, we are so good, we are so effective, that China must really have cheated at every moment. And they really must be our enemy also. This is extremely dangerous. It's either us or them at the top of the world. And only a U.S.-led world is a safe world. Otherwise, we're all going to be destroyed by China. It is, in my view, a fantasy misunderstanding. I'll start again with the basic proposition. China's living standards are about a third of the U.S. China has decades of economic development to make. China faces major challenges. Population is now starting to decline quite significantly. China will probably be under 1 billion people by the end of this century, possibly 800 million, according to the UN forecasts, which are mechanical, but still showing how significant. China will age very rapidly. There are many, many challenges. China's not out to take over the world. But the U.S. whole vision is U.S. is the world leader. It's the self-image. It's what I'm afraid is taught at the Kennedy School of Government often. My question would be the following one. If we assume that this conflict is going to end in a way that's not going to be a defeat, an explicit defeat of Russia. Do you see that having any consequences of the future role of dollar as an international currency and 
What do you think is going to happen on the U.S. Treasury bond market in the future? Thank you. Just a, in a general word about uh, the role of the U.S. dollar. It has been a source of a lot of U.S. power and prerogative, the fact that about 60 percent of world trade is denominated in dollars and settled in dollars. And the U.S. banking system is the predominant mechanism for clearing transactions. And the SWIFT system, which is how the U.S. banking system settles transactions, is uh, the instrument by which the U.S. excludes Russia, for example, under the sanctions. I believe that in 10 years from now, the role of the dollar will be much, much less than it is today. Uh, and in 20 years, we'll have a, a very different international monetary system. And the U.S. will have lost uh, what was called by uh, de Gaulle an exorbitant privilege, but it will have lost a privilege of having the key currency in the world. I think there are three reasons for this decline that will come that's already underway. One is that to be the world currency depends on being the predominant economy in the world. <clears throat> and as the U.S. share of the world economy diminishes, it's natural that the role of the U.S. dollar would diminish as well. And we are, as I said, on a gradual, gentle decline, not gentle, but gradual decline of the share of world output due to the U.S., not mainly because of the U.S. collapse, but mainly because the rest of the world develops economically, like China. So that's one reason. The second reason is much more pertinent to this uh, evening, and that is the U.S. began to weaponize the dollar roughly a decade ago. So it basically began to use the dollar as a geopolitical instrument. And my advice is if you are a government that isn't getting along too well with the U.S., hold your reserves in some other currency. Because the U.S. has developed a bad habit of seizing foreign exchange reserves of governments that it doesn't like. And it has done that with Venezuela, with Iran, with Afghanistan, with North Korea, and now with Russia. It views that as a, an easy thing to do. Stroke of a pen by the president, and your antagonist, your foe, can't use their dollars anymore. We even did that with Afghanistan on the way out, seized all, froze all the foreign exchange reserves so that the economy completely collapsed in that impoverished place afterwards. It's nasty, by the way. But more than being nasty, it also is not something you can do over and over again because other countries start to say, maybe we'll hold our reserves in renminbi, thank you, or maybe we'll hold them in some other currency, thank you. And that's what's happening now. So that's a second reason for why the dollar will decline, because it's not just a money, it's an instrument of geopolitics, which it should not be. You can have one or the other, but you can't have the geopolitical instrument for very long. You won't have the key currency anymore. And the third is technological. I think that transactions will not be settled through commercial banks in the future in anything like the way they are now, because we will have digital central bank currencies. And we don't need the commercial banks in the long term to settle our transactions. Probably the digital renminbi will be a first digital currency, probably for use within China. But then it will start to be expanded internationally. Several other central banks will make digital currencies. This is quite different from crypto. Crypto is you have an electronic account that's nonsense, and you think it's going to hold value. It's every day I wake up, sorry to say, if you're Bitcoin lovers, every day that Bitcoin has any value at all, I think the world's still crazy. 
So uh, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value and it's not a legal reserve currency for anything and it's not a legal means of payment and it's not a national fiat currency which can at least settle your debts uh, internally. It's unbelievable that people spend money for this electronic cipher and this arrest of this kid in the United States should tell you this is a little crazy. But what I'm talking about is something else, which is a central bank currency, because there a digital central bank currency is just a means of clearing payments rather than writing checks like we used to do or even making electronic ledgers through Venmo we use in the United States and so forth, uh, whichever e-wallet system you use. The central bank can do that, actually. And I think that we'll go to that kind of settlements. And so the U.S. ability to say, ah, we're going to cut you off from SWIFT, eh, so what? Uh, so I think in 10 years or 15 years from now, it'll be quite a different international monetary system. And uh, my question is, uh, what is your vision of uh, the role of Russia in the, the future in the conflict of uh, U.S. and China? Thank you very much. The role of, of Russia in the conflict between the U.S. and China. The role of Russia in the conflict. Yes. Look, uh, ba basically, um, ba basically, uh, much of the world, as I say, is going to have trade relations with China because <laughs> why not? It's it's a good trading partner, and uh, China will be the world's main trading partner for a significant majority of the world. And Russia is among them and physically uh, being neighbors uh, so that Russia can make uh, gas and oil pipelines and provide uh, other raw materials which China doesn't have, makes them very complementary economies. And since the US has designated both of them as enemies, it makes them natural allies. We. We did the one thing that Zbigniew Brzezinski said, never do. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was uh, you know, the uh, geopolitical strategist who in 1997 said how important Ukraine was for this geopolitical competition. But in his book, The Global Chessboard, he says, well, this will be the geographical pivot of Eurasia. But the one thing the United States must never do is drive China and Russia together. Uh, and, and then he says, but this is very unlikely to happen. Uh, and so, you know, it's uh, the US, you shouldn't declare enemies this way. Uh, it, make, it doesn't even make sense on your own terms uh, of your own geopolitical competition. Uh, and that was, you know, that was Nixon's idea of triangulating between Russia and China, or Soviet Union and China, uh, during the Cold War period. But we did what we were told, oh, that will never happen because it's such a bad idea. So right now, that is a, a friendship without limits, as they say, because the U.S. is targeting both of them. And the U.S. is talking the European Union into more and more of an anti-China policy. And I just can't believe it that Europe would fall for this. Because Europe absolutely for its prosperity needs a good relationship with China. And for a long time in the future, China will be a neighbor of Europe in Eurasia. And so you're actually on the same landmass, too. And so having good relations would be a good thing, but not in the US mindset. And so the US has launched a chips war against China. You know, this is incredible, this chips war, just to, oh my god. I need an hour to say what I wanted to yeah, say, but I'll yeah. say it in I'll say it in uh, in one minute. There's one more the, question. The U.S. So has why. said we're going to try to stop the Chinese economy from, you know, modernizing at the front level by restricting the sale of advanced chips. Terrible idea, in my view. Completely belligerent. But yesterday, 
apparently, according to the Financial Times, I don't know whether it's definitive or not, Netherlands said, we go along with this. If Europe just follows the US on this, it's not going to defeat China, but it sure is going to boomerang against Europe. It makes no sense. And what Europe should be saying to the United States is, calm down. You're still powerful. We still like you. You don't have to, you know, you're still richer than China per capita. You can calm down. We don't want a war with China, too. And that's what Europe should really be saying to the United States for its own Thank group. you, Jeff. But there's one more question. And uh, I, I, really, I really have to, to make a, an exception, because I, I really don't know what would have happened if I don't allow this. But my wife actually wants to ask a question. It this is a catches me by surprise. So <laughs> Natasha Yeremich wants to ask a question. <laughs> Okay, an easy question. <laughs> Current situation on climate change is hot and getting hotter fast. And just to give you, uh, to, to give you a, a couple of uh, grim realities on this, the rate of warming of Earth on average has been 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade during the last 30 years. So that means that Earth has warmed by about half of one degree C over the past 30 years. Earth is now warming currently at about twice that rate, at about 0.36 degrees Celsius per decade. Now compared to the pre-industrial temperature, the Earth is 1.2 degrees warmer than it was before industrialization. If you take 0.36 degrees C per decade, that means we'll be 1.56 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial 10 years from now. That means we will be above the limit set in the Paris Agreement within 10 years. And according to my favorite climatologist, Dr. James Hansen, who I've relied on for decades, and he's been right on everything he's told me for decades, he thinks that in, a, yeah, in the next few years, when we go from the La Nina cycle in the Pacific Ocean to an El Nino, which raises the Earth's temperature on what's called an interannual basis, we could have an excess beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, the Paris limit, within the next five years, the next big El Nino. We're in a La Nina right now. All of this is to say, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any doubt at all about global warming, it's real, it's serious, it's accelerating, and it's going to create a terrible mess no matter what we do. But if we don't do what we need to do, it's going to create a catastrophic mess.